And we saw this come into the Greek and Roman civilizations as well. Sir William Ridgway in The Origin of Metallic Weights and Standards described the Greek temple activities of a later period. The temple shrines of Delphi and Olympia, Delos and Dodora, were centers not merely of religious cult, but likewise of trade and commerce. Merchants and traders taking advantage of the assembling together of large bodies of worshippers from various quarters to tempt them with their wares. The temple authorities encouraged trade in every way. They constructed sacred roads, which gave faculty facility for traveling at a time when roads were almost unknown, and placed those who traveled on them under the protection of their god. <clears throat> at a time of the sacred festivals, all strife had to cease, offering a breathing space for trade and commerce. Hence the probability is considerable that the art of minting money first had its birth in the sanctuary of some god. Remember in the movie 300, 300 when the priests told Leonides to observe the Carnea to not go to war with Xerxes. This is what they're talking about. Quiggin, describing how real metal hooks, knives, and spits used as money became transformed into token representation of such objects, writes, To us, looking backward, the next step appears obvious and inevitable, but it was only in rare spots, possibly only in one rare spot, that the final stage was reached in definite weights of metal, rounded, flattened, and stamped can be called coins. The monetization of gold begins around 1500 and 10,000 BC. Money systems of Mediterranean begin shifting slowly, but directly from cattle standard to a gold weight standard. And it appears that the temples played an important role in monetizing the gold. Gold would have been the easiest metal for primitive man to obtain in the ancient world. You know, copper would have been the second easiest and silver would have been the hardest to, um, to mine, according to Zarlenga. And the other thing that's important to note here, too, is that a lot of this gold was used mostly for symbolic ornamentation. You know, it wasn't necessarily used for circulation. It wasn't accumulated for economic reasons, for they could never actually be used in commerce, Supply and demand had little to do with the production of precious metals, concluded Francis Amasa Walker, once head of the U.S. Bureau of Statistics. Again, you got to get your own copy of the book. The abundance of gold held by the temples after centuries of successful accumulation would be one reason to monetize it. They've got all this gold collecting. They're not doing anything with it. They may as well put it into circulation so that they can get some value out of it and some value back for it. <clears throat> Declaring a fixed amount of gold equal to one cow alleviates the problem of gold abundance. Further, more abstract form of money is created in dis blah, 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 blah. This would also make it difficult for people other than the priests to obtain substantial amounts of gold except through them. And then they could create a value for it by accepting it for their services, which people considered a necessary part of life. Even, for example, to pay for temple prostitutes, as described by Herodotus and Strabo, for later periods. Our studies suggest this control factor is potentially more important than intrinsic value considerations, that money is more a question of power than economics. Temple prostitutes, remember that scene before the, the priest in Delphi? told Leonides that he couldn't fight, and then they have the, the temple girl dancing in front of there in the movie 300. <clears throat> so, Adam Smith's whole notion that, you know, an invisible market, an invisible hand, is what determines the value of gold. Mm. Does not look at all historically accurate. And our entire economy is sort of based on his work. We're almost there, we're almost done. Just one more presentation to show you all. Boom, let's talk about a little grease a little bit. A little bit more, I should say.
It's talked about gold becoming money, the gold standard, uh, concepts two, right? One cow. Gold being the easiest metal to obtain. Um, when Alexander seized a lot of gold in his conquest, you can tell he wasn't putting it into circulation because they're using other things for exchange, like corn and livestock. Like, they're different monetary systems coexisting at the same time. Kind of like now how there's alternative currencies floating around out there. So the temples created the demand and then controlled that demand. Temple treasuries often functioned like banks, loaning not only their own money, but money that had been entrusted to them for safekeeping. Professor Andreas wrote, the shrines were extremely cautious on loans. I mentioned that. And um, the temples could form powerful alliances as in about 418 BC, when during the Peloponnesian War, the treasure that was uh, with Xerxes, I believe, the ten Mesur temples were united to one board, calling itself the Treasurers of the Gods. Such combinations had the potential to create monetary problems for a city by moving gold or silver into or out of the city. And with their own local coinages, the city-states could disenfranchise foreign coin and metal hordes and exercise more control over their destinies. State coinage then may have the result from a power shift development or an understanding between the city-states and the international temple cults between government and religion. The city coinages were still closely associated with the temples, with the city's mint annexed to a particular temple. In Athens, the mint was a sanctuary of Stephan IV Theseus. A lot of problems with this intrinsically valuable gold and eventually silver coinage. Alexander Delmar wrote, It was only necessary for an enemy to quietly withdraw some of the precious metals in circulation, or as quietly to add illegally fabricated, albeit full-weighted coins, to the circulation counterfeit in order to produce a prolonged financial crisis and alter the entire relations of society. Changes in mining, or even in the fashion of wearing gold jewelry, could affect Wars waged over gold. Gold was one of the key mechanisms that gave bankers all these powers to create wars. You know, and a lot of what we see is that monetary control moving sort of like so each Greek city state, you know, in the West had its own gold coins, its own system. And of course, the problem with that was that, you know, the bankers could just move hordes of this metal from one city to another and completely mess up local economies. And so, <clears throat> there was um, these Greek city-states would have all kinds of problems, you know, before the reformers came through. Check this out. This is from Plutarch, father of biography, he wrote a book called Parallel Lives, comparing ancient Greek um, historical figures like, uh, like Alexander to Roman historical figures like Caesar. And so some of this has to be taken with a grain of salt, but this is a, if, if you like antiquity and, you know, the ancient 300 Spartan myth, a lot of the material from that comes directly from uh, this document here, which we've reprinted on our Greens for Monetary Reform website. And um, in this document, you really get a sense of how the Pelinors which were Lycurgus's form of money, these iron bars soaked in vinegar, 
transform society, you know? These Pelinors wear a, uh, a system of public money, a system appeared to be based on law, like Aristotle advocated, where the value of money was probably determined in part by decree and mainly by the legal number of units in circulation, not by the commodity of which it was made. Damar called it a numerary system. Today we call it a fiat or token money system where the total amount of money allowed into circulation is regulated by law and where the value of these symbols serving as money depends on the limiting the number in circulation. And this worked for Sparta for about three and a half centuries. Things were a mess in Lacedonia, which is what they called their country. And so they asked the great Lycurgus to come back and help clean up the city. Find my place here. Adrian, too far. Uh, so, they wanted Lycurgus to expel from the state arrogance and envy, luxury and crime and the more inveterate diseases of one superfluity. He obtained of them to renounce their properties and consent to a new division of land so that they should all live together on equal footing. Their society was a mess from this coinage, from the, this new money to monetary systems. <clears throat> and so, when Lycurgus came back, he divided up the land, he divided up equally, and the other thing he did, he wasn't satisfied with this, so he had another strategy. He commanded that all gold and silver coin be called in, <clears throat> and that only a sort of money made of iron should be current, a great weight and quantity of which was very little worth, so that to lay up twenty or thirty pounds there was required a pretty large closet, and to remove it, nothing less than the, a yoke of oxen. With the diffusion of this money, at once a number of vices were banished from ancient Sparta. For who would rob another of such a coin, an iron bar, a worthless iron bar? Who would unjustly detain or take by force or accept as bribe, a thing which it was not easy to hide, nor a credit to have, nor indeed of any use to cut in pieces? For when it was just red hot, they quenched it in vinegar, and by that means spoiled it, and made it almost incapable of being worked. <clears throat> and check this out. This is when it gets really sociological. This is when ancient Sparta completely changes. So he, de he like Kyrgyz declared an outlaw of all needless and superfluous arts, but here he might almost have spared his proclamation, for they would have gone without the gold and silver. So... So there were no more means of purchasing foreign goods and small wares. Merchants sent shiploads into the Laconian ports. No rhetoric master, no itinerant fortune teller, no harlot monger, no prostitution, no gold or silversmith. No con men, no advertising industry essentially with this new form of money. Wasted nothing that for the rich had no advantage here over the poor, and as their wealth and abundance had no road to come abroad, but were shut up at home doing nothing, and in this way they became excellent artists in common, necessary things, bedstands, chairs, and tables, and such like staple utensils in a family were admirably well made there. Their cup particularly was very much in fashion and eagerly bought up by soldiers is Critias reports, for its color was such as to prevent water drunk upon the necessity and disagreeable to look at from being noticed, and the shape of it was such that the mud stuck to the sides so that only the purer part came to the drinker's mouth. So they were really good craftsmen, these ancient Spartans. And they had their law giver, like Kyrgyz, and their Spartan monetary system to thank for that. <coughs> and, uh, I want to draw your attention a little bit forward in this document. They talk about all the other stuff. They talk about their educational systems, their sexual behaviors, how they raise their children in this document. 
you know, they talk about, like, bathing their kids in wine and to see if they're, like, strong enough. And if they're not strong enough, they throw them off the cliff and, and stuff like that. Um, it's page 13. I'm looking for here. I thought I wrote a note. And what I want to show you, too, I want to show you is what happened to Sparta's national defense <coughs> system after they started using this form of money. You know, before they were all trying to count each other, there's a lot of crime and vice in the city. But now once they had the city, they had time to train. When the Spartans were in the field, their exercises were generally more moderate. Actually, let me back up a little bit. I'm, I'm getting lost in the history. I'm sorry, I'm tripping out. I was just checking out Spartan verbal ha habits. So when, you know, when they were at war, their training was more moderate. They trained harder during times of peace than during times of war. When their army was drawn up a battle array in the enemy near, the king sacrificed. Likely to possess with fear of any transport of fury. So, indeed, one of the greatest and highest blessings, like Kyrgyz procured for his people, was the abundance of leisure which proceeded from his forbidding them the exercise of any mean mechanical trade, of the money-making that depends on the troublesome about going about seeing people and doing business. They had no need at all in a state where wealth obtained no honor and respect. So they had time to train. The discipline of Spartan soldiers continued until after they were fully grown men, no one was allowed to live after his own fancy, but the city was a sort of camp in which every man had his share of provisions and business set out and looked upon himself not so much born to serve his own ends as the interests of his country. Therefore, if they were commanded nothing else, they had nothing else to do. They went to see the boys perform their exercises in the academy, and they would teach them something useful or learn it themselves from the teachers. And this is because they had the time to do so. Leisure time. We are fighting to an end for wage slavery. So, just to sort of conclude, you know, we started talking about Aristotle, who lived from 384 to 322 B.C. And, you know, he described money as existing by nature, by, sorry, by law not by nature, like gold or a cow. Money is whatever people say it is. And when we allow one small segment of society, like the priests or the bankers, to say what money is, then they take control over everything in society. And um, <coughs> the other really interesting thing is that uh, Plato agreed with Aristotle on money. You know, the, the Platonic method was more theoretical, not as much interested in history, like Aristotle's school. But um, Plato definitely favored a fiat money system for his republic. His strict monetary regulations show an awareness of the serious problem with the precious metal monies. In Plato's money system, the law enjoins that no private individual shall possess or hold gourd or silver bullion, but have money only fit for domestic use. Wherefore, our citizens should have a money current among themselves, but not accessible, it's not, but not accessible to the rest of mankind. <clears throat> so, that's it for the origins of money systems. <coughs> money is supposed to be wealth, not debt. That's the bottom 
that's the major takeaway from all this. And um, the lost science money, when you really start to look at it, this is, this is the, the science of money is the science of civilization. The history of money creation is the history, not just of our current economic crisis, but it's a history of the heritage that has been stolen from us by the bankers. And uh, I had a great time giving this talk tonight. I got done a little bit early. I'm kind of surprised. But uh, I hope to see you all again next week. I'm going to work on getting a room. I'm going to set up another link. <clears throat> and uh, like I said, week to week, we're going to keep this conversation going. And um, I hope you all do your homework. Check out greensformonetaryreform.org. Click on the history section. You can see all this stuff here. Don't take my...